The committee will please come to order. Uh, today, the committee continues consideration of H.R. 2454, the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009, sponsored by myself and the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment, Mr. Markey. At yesterday's committee meeting, I brought up the bill for committee consideration and offered the Waxman-Markey Amendment in the nature of substitute, which was pending when the committee recessed. Uh, as Mr. Barton and I discussed in a colloquy yesterday, and as I described in a previous memo to committee members, the amendment in the nature of a substitute is open to amendment at any point. However, to promote orderly and thoughtful deliberation of the amendments, I will exercise the Chair's power of recognition to give priority to amendments in order of title. This means that I will give priority to members who have amendments to Title I over those having amendments to subsequent titles. When the amendments to Title I have been considered, I will then use a similar procedure for considering amendments to the subsequent titles. I also have asked that members submit amendments to the committee at least two hours before offering the amendment to ensure that all members of the committee have sufficient time to review and understand amendments before they are offered. And I'm pleased that members on both sides have been following this policy and my staff has been distributing these amendments to all committee members. I will exercise the Chair's power of recognition to prioritize recognition of members offering amendments that have been submitted consistent with the advance submission policy I've described. I now uh, turn to the pending amendment in the nature of a substitute and without objection amendments drafted to H.R. 2454 are made in order to this amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, does uh, any member seek recognition? Uh, for what purpose, Mr. Barton, do you seek recognition? Uh, just to strike the requisite number of words at this time. Uh, gentleman is recognized. Just to ask five questions. Yes. Um, I appreciate what you just said in your um, opening statement. I want to clarify um, some of that. Uh, the minority is going to make a good faith effort uh, for this two-hour notification, but there are going to be some amendments. Uh, in fact, we're redrafting several uh, as we speak uh, that, that we're probably not going to get out. Well, we could get out in two hours' time if we if, if we uh, go as long as I think we're going to go, but there will be some amendments that, that, that will be timely for specific titles that will not meet the two-hour notification. So what, what's your, how do you handle an amendment to Title I uh, before we go to Title II if it's not out within two hours of consideration while Title I is under consideration. Well, I would hope that if members have amendments to Title I, they try to get out as quickly as possible. We're gonna and if we, uh, we are not closing out a title. So if members uh, do not get a chance to get their amendment to ready for Title I and, and we're out of time then, we'll move forward and then you and I can uh, work out a, a, a schedule to maybe return to Title I uh, some early point but if we don't, uh, all the amendments to titles that have previously been considered will uh, be uh, pushed to the end of the uh, consideration for the legislation. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks. Uh, for, uh, the gentleman seeks recognition for the purposes of offering an amendment. And has it been shared uh, in two hours in advance? Okay. And is it uh, an amendment to Title I? It is, Mr. Chairman. Kirk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Dingle of Michigan on behalf of himself, Mr. Inslee of Washington, and Ms. <laughs> Mr. Gordon of Tennessee. In Title I, add at the end the following new subtitle. Subtitle J, Nuclear and Advanced Technology. Without a Mr. Chairman, I reserve the right. Gentlemen, reserve I reserve the right. a point of order. You reserve a point of order? Yeah. Do you reserve a right to uh, the yes, I unanimous point consent to read the amendment? To forego the reading? Yeah, you can forego the reading. I'll, I'll forego the reading. Okay. Uh, gentleman from Oregon reserves a point of order on the amendment. 
and uh, let me again put the unanimous consent request that uh, the reading be suspended uh, for this, uh, this uh, Dingle Amendment. Without objection, that will be the order. And gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes to speak on his amendment. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, the amendment adds a new title to the bill before us regarding the financing of energy technologies. I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues, Mr. Inslee and Mr. Gordon. Uh, and, and in having their support in the development of this amendment. While we approach the need for this amendment on behalf of different energy technologies, Mr. Inslee with a strong interest in the development of renewable energy, and I with my strong interest in ensuring the development of the next generation of nuclear power, we agreed that our current system of federal funding for energy technologies must be more robust and flexible to meet America's future energy needs. And I want to thank my good friend, Mr. Gordon, for joining in this matter. To this end, we propose two changes, which I will describe further. Modifications to Title 17 Loan Guarantee Program created in the 2005 Energy Act, one of, the five, one of our major energy sources uh, for project funding, and the creation of a Department of Energy of a new Clean Energy Deployment Administration. In Title 17, we make clear that a final term sheet from the Secretary constitutes a binding commitment such that the energy projects can obtain uh, the required non-federal energy financing with surety that the federal guarantee will proceed. The amendment also ensures that any fees collected by the Department under the program are captured for the program by creating a new fund for incentives for innovative technologies and allowing the Secretary to access those funds without further appropriation for energy projects. Lastly, on Title 17, we make, in my view, a long overdue change, supported by the nuclear energy industry to add Davis-Bacon prevailing wage protections to Title 17. We made this adjustment in the Recovery Act for the newly created loan guarantee for transmission and renewables, and it's the right thing to do here. This amendment will also create a new Clean Energy Deployment Administration at DOE. This new entity with members appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate, would provide financing to a wide range of energy technologies from renewable energy to nuclear power to coal with carbon capture and storage. Uh, for those members who share my interest in nuclear energy, this program will share many of the features of the Title 17 program. It will provide 80 percent of project costs, but it will avoid duplication with Title 17. No technology will be able to get more than 30 percent of the financial support available from CEDA uh, so that the funds can be spread around to different worthy projects. I believe this is a good amendment worthy of the committee's support. I urge my colleagues to support it, and if anybody's got any questions, I'll be glad to respond. I would note to my good friend from Oregon, it's not subject to a point of order. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dingle. Discussion of the uh, Dingle Amendment? Mr. Chairman. Martin. Um, I have questions. Uh, Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. For the, uh, for the council. Um, this new subtitle is a brand new program that's not in existence, is that correct? Section 191 that would be created under subtitle J, um, those are revisions to an existing program, the Title 17 loan program, uh, which was established under the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005. And there are several additional sections starting with section 192 that involve the creation of a Clean Energy Deployment Administration. So that's a brand new program? That is a new program. Okay. It's going to be in the Department of Energy? I can refer you to specific language. Um, on page 12 of the amendment, uh, it reads, there is established in the Department of Energy an administration to be known as the Clean Energy Deployment Administration, 
under the direction of the administrator of the administration and the board of directors. So we have a new program in the Department of Energy. Other than it says nu nuclear and advanced technologies, what other technologies are are eligible for this loan guarantee program besides uh, conventional nuclear power? If the if There's the author a, if the author of the amendment wants to answer, he can answer too. On page five of the amendment, there's a definition of clean energy technology. So it can be anything. A breakthrough technology. It presents a significant opportunity to advance the goals developed under Section 195 as uh, assessed under the methodology established by the Advisory Council, but has generally not been considered a commercially ready technology. Could, could the author of the amendment enlighten us as to what that really means? I didn't hear the question. I said, could the author of the amendment enlighten us as to what, what these other advanced technologies, what do you have in mind? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, we know that there are going to be new technologies. Uh, we know that, that we're going to have to have to provide ways of getting them funded and financed where there is no other source of funding through the regular through the more regular channels of commerce. For example, tidal, uh, perhaps a d direct on-stream uh, generation through through uh, river generation, uh, perhaps some unique kind of wind or solar, uh, perhaps uh, uh, generation of power through energy gradients, differentials in the ocean. So it's really open-ended. I mean, it, of course, you don't have a clue. If you're trying to generate new energy and generate new sources, uh, you've got to allow uh, the department to have a mechanism for getting these new kinds of energy on the market and getting them and getting them developed otherwise we might find them being developed in china or some other awkward place like that okay could could i ask the council or the author what's the authorization level that we're we're authorizing for this new program in section 194 on page 8 of the amendment. Is your microphone on? Yes, I'll okay. just move it closer. Um, section 194, subsection B, authorization of appropriations. There are authorized to be appropriated to the fund such sums as are necessary to carry out this subtitle. Such sums. Could, could the author of the amendment enlighten me as to, are we talking about hundreds of millions such sums, hundreds of billions of such sums, trillions of such sums. What's your, what's your best guess as to what such, normally we don't do such sums in this committee. But Well, uh, I'm, I'm willing to accept a reasonable amendment. Uh, I just want to see uh, that we get these programs funded and financed and uh, we do have the uh, limits that are imposed by the fact that they're going to be functioning from monies that are going to be coming into the government in the first place. Uh, I'd hate to see these kinds of programs uh, die or not be funded for want of availability of funding. I'm not able to tell you what the need is, but I think any, it's like uh, beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Well, Mr. I know my... <laughs> My first five minutes has expired, Mr. Chairman, but I just want to make sure we understand here. This is our very first amendment. And it's from the esteemed... Without objection, gentlemen, be given two additional minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's from our esteemed uh, former chairman, uh, my good friend, but it's a brand new program. It is totally open-ended. Uh, there's really no definition. 
to what these advanced technologies are, and it's totally open-ended as to funding. So it, it's, it's somewhat uh, ironic that our very first amendment out of the box um, is an open-ended definitional, definitionally, definitional program and open-ended in terms of funding program. Um, so I would, I would, well, I'm certainly not opposed to the concept. Um, I understand what, what a nuclear technology is, but um, I would say I have to oppose this in its current form because it, it just doesn't have enough structure. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'd be happy to yield. It's not unusual uh, to have uh, authorizations of such sums as may be necessary that would then be up to the President's budget and uh, the budget enacted by the Congress and then the specific appropriation decided upon by the Appropriations Committee. So I, I just wanted to make that one point. But I also wanted to uh, thank Chairman Dingell and Mr. Inslee and Mr. Gordon for their thoughtful and balanced amendment. I think it's a good one. It, it has uh, sensible reforms to Title 17 loan guarantee program and a clean energy deployment administration to provide financial assistance to nuclear power as well as renewable and uh, other advanced technologies. Uh, we want to promote the domestic development and deployment of clean energy technologies by establishing a self-sustaining clean energy deployment administration. So I uh, uh, thank you for yielding to me, and I, I, uh, I think it's a good amendment, and I'm sorry to disagree with you with all due respect, but I uh, think it's <laughs> It a good won't amendment. be the first time in this markup, the last time in this markup, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not totally opposed to the concept. I just think it needs a little more structure. Um, if, if Mr. Inslee or Mr. Gordon have any ideas, I think if we could put some limiting factor in in terms of an authorization and, and some definition in terms of technologies that are available, we could probably accept it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, would the chairman yield to me? I think my time's expired, but to the extent I have time, I'll be happy to yield. I ask the gentleman to be given one, one additional minute. Without objection, that'll be the order. Um, I want to I want to thank my good friend from Texas. We 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 are close to agreement here. We have a situation where there's a lot of things that we have a chance to do but can't do under the bill as drawn because there's going to be a lot of kinds of energy development that will not be able to get funding unless we provide a mechanism whereby that can happen. This will make those things happen from the uh, rather from a, a proper government source. This is going to be the subject of, first of all, the continuing process of the Congress, but it is also going to be subject to the, to the budget process. And I would just say to my good friend that unless we put something like this in here, you're going to find that we are not going to be funding a lot of projects that are going to be necessary for addressing the other problems that we have with regard to the bill, including how we're going to take care of the American in energy industry in both the production of new mechanisms for energy production, but also in terms of offsets and things like that. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Inslee seeks recognition. Thank you. I just want to respond to uh, Mr. a couple of Mr. Barton's concerns as far as limiting factors. Um, you know, this whole idea is, is that the devil is in the details, but the devil is actually in the financing when it comes to really getting clean energy going. And on page uh, five, I just want to allude to the language that limits the program to breakthrough technology. And that's technology with a, with a significant opportunity to advance our goals that's generally not been considered a commercially ready technology as a result of high perceived technology risk or other similar factors. The fact of the matter is we've got some brilliant Americans out right, right now and they try to cross what they call the valley of death. And the valley of death is the, the, the gap between venture capital, which helps these people get their technology out of the garage into a prototype, but then you have to scale up to the first commercially viable scale of projects, like uh, uh, algae-based biofuels with sapphire energy, like uh, lithium-ion batteries at A123 battery, like energy efficiency at Verdeum, and I want to point out as well, this is not just energy generation. 
This is designed to help high technology in transmission and storage and efficiency. So when you've got a company like Verdeum in Seattle that does energy efficiency and they want to scale up, it helps them. So I want to point out that this is trying to get that group of people that are trying to cross that financing valley of death to try to get them to the first commercially viable scale project. I want to point out two things I think are, are of interest in this bill. First off, we do have a limit of 30 percent. We do want to make sure that no one technology is the only one that is financed. And one of the wisdoms of the successes of this bill, I think, is that we have addressed all of the potential technologies from coal to nuclear to solar to wind, you name it. We are being eclectic and multivaried, and that's the right approach. Second, I think there is a little more work. I hope we, as we continue this process, uh, in our original bill, Mr. Dingle and I introduced, we had a provision for indirect financing. I hope we can find a way as the matter progresses to get back to that issue, and I commend this amendment. Thank you. Would the gen gentleman yield for? Yes. Would, would, would the authors of the amendment be willing to put some structure into the actual bill like you just talked about? At least you gave some examples of the kind of technologies. Would the, would the gentleman from Texas yield? I'm, I'm just asking a question, Mr. Inslee, but I'm sure he'll yield to you. Well, Mr. certainly. Mr. can speak for me. Mr. Yield to Barton to Inslee to Dingle. Well, I, I, I thank my good friend. The answer to the question is yes. We'll be happy to talk to our good friend from Texas and try and see to it that his concerns are met, because I think they're valid and legitimate. And we can do this as the matter goes forward. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. F further discussion of the amendment. For what uh, purpose? Uh, strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I, I might direct this uh, question uh, to uh, my good friend, Mr. Dingle. I know it's, it's my understanding that uh, similar language uh, has now uh, been adopted in the Senate. Uh, and the one difference between this amendment as it's proposed and what the Senate actually did was on page 26 where it says that no particular technology has provided more than 30 percent of the financial support available. And my question is, we don't know what the uh, appropriated level will be because that's going to be up to the Appropriations uh, Committee. So we don't know how much money it, itself, but let's say that they do come up with uh, some great new different technology, that it's a breakthrough that we ought to pursue. Well, 30 percent may be too little. Uh, 30 percent of question mark. It may be too little. The Senate provision as uh, uh, did not have a limitation on uh, that, that paralleled the 30 percent. In fact, uh, our former colleague uh, Mr. Sanders from Vermont offered an amendment to limit it to 20 percent, in essence uh, about the same, and that amendment was rejected in the Senate 18 to 5 pretty overwhelming. So when the gentleman, when my friend says that you'd be willing to accept a, a reasonable amendment, to me a reasonable amendment would be to strike this 30 percent provision, and I, I think that you'd find some pretty general strong support well, here, and it would mirror what the Senate did uh, and not limit a breakthrough technology that we may not know about for down the road. Well, uh, if the gentleman would yield, I, I'd... I'd I'd like to begin by expressing my respect and affection for the gentleman and think he makes a good point. As the gentleman observed, this is a small difference between our bill and the Senate bill, and uh, with all the respect I can muster for the United States Senate, which occasionally is difficult, uh, I, would, I would observe I'll be happy to work with the gentleman along these lines. I have to tell the gentleman that uh, uh, the, the the, the concern I have and that my good friend, I think, shares is that not every, rather that one big drain from one particular industry might suck away funding that would go help other industries. Uh, and since a lot of these demands are going to be small from new and burgeoning industries, uh, we might wind up with something like my good friends in nuclear, and I'm very strongly in favor of nuclear. Uh, would wind up with a situation where they would draw all the money out and there'd be nothing left for some new kind of energy generation that might be helpful. The gentleman raises a point which is a good one. I would be delighted to work with him because I have great affection for him. 
Well, well, thank you. Did, would it, would the gentleman consider striking this, and we can continue to work together? Um, I'd, just, I'd, just I'd be willing to return to it. Um, I've always felt that a bird in hand is worth a couple or three in a bush. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anyone want on my side want any yeah. my remaining time? Mr. Shimkus? I'll yield to Mr. Shimkus. Oh, all right, I yield back. Thank you. Further recognition. Mr. Mark, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, this particular amendment um, is a centerpiece um, in the nuclear energy industry's goals for this legislation. This is a provision uh, which uh, helps to provide uh, financing for the nuclear industry going forward. Uh, it is something that uh, is supported uh, on our side. Uh, however, uh, it is divided in a way in which other advanced technologies can also uh, derive uh, financial uh, support. Uh, and that is just consistent with uh, uh, any kind of portfolio uh, which is diversified uh, so that everything isn't in just one technology. Uh, but uh, the nuclear uh, energy industry can, in fact, receive upwards of 30 percent of all of this funding. Uh, and, uh, and it is why m most of the nuclear electric utilities in the United States are endorsing this legislation, what, by the way. What, and this is, an this is additional language on top of that that Mr. Dingell is proposing uh, today. So it's the formulation, as Mr. Dingell has it, is a, is a quite um, balanced um, but open uh, uh, agenda, uh, which uh, does give the nuclear industry uh, a financial footing uh, that can help them uh, in the years ahead, uh, as it will with other advanced uh, technologies. So I think it's a it's a good balance that he has struck, uh, and I urge the committee would, to embrace would, the amendment. Would the gentleman yield for a question? I'd be glad to. Uh, as the distinguished subcommittee chairman, I want to make sure I understand what you just said. Conventional nuclear energy projects in this section are eligible for loans from this Clean Energy Investment Fund. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, they are available for loan guarantees from the Title 17 program, and similarly, they are eligible f from the Clean Energy Development Administration program. Yes. Well, I'm not. That's not my question. On page eight of this amendment in section 194, there is established a Clean Energy Investment Fund, and my question is: Is a conventional nuclear generation power project eligible for this clean energy investment fund established under section 194 of the pending amendment the, the, yeah, the, 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 the criteria in the amendment is that it will be subsidizing advanced technology in other words the, the, rather than subsidizing already existing technology uh, the goal in this uh, amendment is to subsidize advanced technology, which the nuclear industry says that they are ready to go and make that investment. And this is going to help them to move to the next generation uh, technology. And that is the objective of the legislation. They are trying to focus on the future, trying to create a portfolio of the future that nuclear is a part of. And this allows them to gain access to the financing for that new advanced nuclear technology. So the answer to that is have. yes. The answer is what, what, it said the language itself says the term clean energy technology means a technology related to the production, use, transmission, storage, control, uh, or conservation uh, of energy that will contribute to a stabilization of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations through reduction, avoidance, and sequestration. So that is br very broad language uh, which, uh, which the nuclear power industry would qualify of, uh, under uh, and uh, an, an application, I think to this uh, well, it's an important question mm -hmm. I mean and, and I'm not being argumentative would, would the chairman yield 
I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to yield to the gentleman. Conventional sources are eligible for lending under Section 17 or Title 17. Um, under this, they would not be, but new uh, kinds of generation would be under this. Um, so a reactor that has never been built but that has had the design approved, a nuclear reactor that has never been built for commercial operation but does, is an advanced reactor design okay. that, that has been approved, would that would, project be would, eligible for this clean energy would, investment? Would the gentleman yield because he's talking to the particular subject of nuclear. On nuclear, the next generation of, of nuclear would be classed as new kinds of generation and would be eligible both under Title 17 and under, these, under the provisions of this amendment. Time of the gentleman from Massachusetts has expired. For further discussion of the amendment. I'm still not sure what the, the I, I had Mr. Markey, I think, give me a yes, and I had Mr. Dingle, I think, give me a no. No. And then I, a maybe. I, no, I, I agree with Mr. Dingle's interpretation. Under, under the um, Clean Energy Development Administration, I think he properly characterized the, the qualification uh, terms. Well, and under the loan program, its existing technology under the Clean Energy Development uh, Deployment uh, Administration, uh, it is uh, a, a more advanced technology. Well, under, under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which this amends, a conventional, the whole purpose of that was that these new nuclear power plants, these new designs, could get these loans and could be built, but they are designs that have already been approved. So I... I understand what Chairman Dingle says. He says if you have an advanced reactor that hasn't been approved yet, it would be new technology and it would qualify. But if it was an existing reactor that's been approved but hasn't been built, it wouldn't. The chairman yield for with, with the, with yeah. the chairman yield with the chairman yield. I think we're arguing about something here that, that, that is, is probably not important because... Well, it's very important because it's well, billions of dollars. If the gentleman would permit, um, what, what we're talking about is the next generation of... Uh, the, only, the only nuclear that's going to be uh, constructed in this country is going to be the next generation. And so it fits very nicely into what I have said, and it fits very nicely into assuring the loans for the next generation of nuclear. Gentlemen, yield for a moment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to ask counsel, uh, Every on page 8 under section 194, it's mentioned before, it says establish uh, in the Treasury a revolving fund to be known as the Clean Energy Investment Fund. And it talks about such sums as may be appropriated to supplement the fund. Then under authorization, it goes on to say there are authorized to be appropriated to the fund such sums as necessary to ca carry out this subtitle. So those are the authorization. You go down to expenditure. It says an amount in the fund shall be available to the administrator or the administration for obligations without fiscal year limitation to remain available until expended. Am I correct in saying that this is an open-ended section which will allow this <laughs> clean energy investment fund Joe? to authorize without limits any amount of money and to expend any amount of money without any time of oversight. That's right. That's correct. Is that correct? Um, under section 194, as you said, there is an authorization and then there's a provision for expenditures from fund. Uh, there's no further language here. But, I mean, couldn't you interpret that to mean that you could authorize any amount of money from one dollar up to a trillion, you could expend any amount of money from one dollar up to a trillion, there's no limitation. If that's, is that true that you could spend any kind of uh, amount of money to develop this clean energy investment fund? Is that true, yes or no? This is subject to appropriations, so only appropriated funds. No, but it's saying without limit. All necessary to carry that. So the question to you, Council, is the language as it is, 
is establishing a clean energy investment fund based upon any amount of money without limit. Isn't that what it says? It's appropriated sums. Yeah, which means any amount of money. That's not what the language says. Well, uh, yeah, I'll yield to my colleague. Thank you for yielding. I, just to, clar to clarify, Mr. Stearns here, uh, in, in Section 1I4 on page 8, it says that uh, this Clean Energy Investment Fund, consisting of, number one, such amounts as are deposited in the fund under this subtitle, and then, number two, appropriated funds, which leaves the indication that money is coming from two different sources here, appropriated funds and those deposited under the subtitle. So those funds under the subtitle, what does that refer to? I believe the language such amounts as are deposited in the fund under the subtitle refers to, at the bottom of page 8, administrative expenses. There is a provision there, fees. Fees collected for administrative expenses shall be available without limitation to cover applicable expenses to the extent that administrative expenses are not reimbursed through fees, an amount not to exceed 1.5 percent of the amounts in the fund as of the beginning of each fiscal year shall be available to pay the administrative expenses for the fiscal year necessary well, I understand to carry out that. the subtitle. But from the front end, these limitations on the fund on Section 9, but on the front end they could appropriate, depending upon the appropriators, they could appropriate any amount of, any amount of money to do this. Well, I'm just, I guess my point with the Council is, what you're saying is when I ask the question, yes or no, can they appropriate any amount of money, you're saying it's up to the appropriators. Is that what you're saying? Would, would, would the gentleman yield? Oh, sure. Okay. And I thank him. Uh, there's two sources of funding. One is what the appropriators give, and the other is the money that's paid into the fund as a part of the uh, activities of the people who are uh, the generators of this fund, right? And they're subject to different limitations. And I think you, we can address the concerns of my good friend by identifying what the difference is between the two uh, sources of money in terms of the way they well, are treated. Let me reclaim my time, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dingle. I guess the point I'm having trouble with is that it appears to me in this section 194, the bill, the amendment might be very beneficial, but the problem is it appears to me that there's unlimited amount of money that can be appropriated and then I understand that there's an extent to which there's percentages later, but it looks like it's open-ended both in the appropriation side and the expenditure side and I just think that's reason enough not to support this amendment and I just would ask the authors of the amendment to withdraw it to take Mr. Barton's point and Mr. Upton's point as well as try to establish a little closer fiscal control of what we're talking about here. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very, very briefly, uh, we simply can't get there from here in terms of climate change or energy independence without new technologies. Uh, and, 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 and some of which are going to have to be transformational. Now, that's going to be expensive. Uh, Chairman uh, Waxman, um, under many legitimate um, demands uh, simply was not able to carve out, uh, you know, enough money in this bill for the type of research that we need. Again, this is because he, no fault of his own, it's just there are other demands. And, and this is another way to try to leverage uh, those funds, and I think it's very important that we do so. And I think, and to my friend from Florida, we're really getting a little picky about, about the appropriations here. I mean, it's fact of the matter that if the appropriations if they want to appropriate more money than is authorized, they can do it, and they do it sometimes. Oftentimes we say such money as uh, or such sums as the appropriators deem necessary. So uh, I, I really, uh, there may be concerns to be had, but I don't think that the sums that the appropriators are going to be, you know, going wild is, is one of those. Um, and so, again, I think this is, you know, this is an important way to try to leverage to a goal that unanimously I think we would all agree upon, and that is energy independence. Well, the gentleman yields to the question. Certainly, certainly. 
You mentioned such sums as may be necessary. No, no I, I'm saying I'm saying that that is often done okay. with with legislation, and uh, and again, it's always subject to the appropriators. Also, the appropriators sometimes authorize or appropriate more money than is authorized. So I, I don't think I that we have to be that concerned about this as a check and balance. Just just for, just as a as a question, how much money do you think this is going to take? Based upon your argument that the appropriators can appropriate more money if necessary, is there anybody in this room that knows how much? I, I don't think any, about I, I, here? I don't think anybody can answer that until you get further down the road. But the, I mean, can we ballpark it? I mean, are we talking about half a billion or? Half well, a I mean, the, the, or, or I the, mean, I would think somebody in this room with this amendment could at least give us an idea what we're talking about. There are going to be transformational types of of. Um, uh, energies that we can't think of now. now. If you were to take something that we know of, for, for example, taking nanotechnology and combining that with solar, then you could probably put, you know, a price tag on that. Um, uh, and, and I think that what we're having here is we're not saying spend as much money till you make the breakthrough. There's still going to be limitations. I mean, you know, there, you know, and there's going to be more than one type of project. And so there may very well be two projects uh, that are affordable. And you make breakthroughs. There may be a third that is, you know, uh, a transformational, but it's going to be too expensive. And this Congress is simply not going to vote that much money for it. So, I mean, ultimately, we will have the final say. And I think that's going to be based upon monies available and as well as um, what we feel is the uh, cost benefit ratio. Well, just one last question. This is not going to, after this passes us and it's passed in the present sign, it's not going to come back to us. It'll be left open ended and as such sums as may re, be necessary, I don't think is in a prudent considering the fiscal situation we're in. And I would think the authors of the amendment would at least struggle to find some amount of money and put that in with a request that they come back for Congress if they need more than that. I right think that's now, a legitimate request, nothing. and I would also say that that this, you know, again, this is this is committee markup. The Senate's going to be working on this. We're going to go to conference. Uh, I, I think that we should should take the best and in, in ideas on this on this project as it, as it moves along. I think we all have the same. Again, we all have the same objective: energy independence. If you want to put a little kicker on that, climate change is a, is a nice little addition to that. Uh, but we all we can at least all share that objective, and. Uh, this is one way to get there. Let's continue. To, let's put it out there. Continue to talk about it and find the best way to implement it. Uh, and I probably don't have anything to yield back, but not, I do if, if I could. Do you have the time, gentlemen? I think you. Uh, gentleman yields back his time. Yes. Yes. Mr. Chairman, who seeks recognition? Reserving. No, I seek uh, to strike the last word. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, counsel. Uh, a couple of questions. There was a, a comment made by, uh, I believe, the gentleman from Michigan, my dear friend, the former chairman of the committee, um, about that the generators would pay the fees that would go into this fund. That would be one source. Could you show me who those generators are and what limitations there are in those fees? There are no specific generators listed in the provision. So the fund that's created here. Um, I believe it's on, it's on page 8, I'm trying to, pay, yeah, page 8, um, uh, section, or line 13, authorization of appropriations and all that. So when it talks about such funds as necessary to carry out that subtitle, these would all be only from uh, taxpayers. These would be taxpayer appropriated funds. There's no fee money that would go into that. Are you referring to subsection B there? Yes, I am. So those are appropriated funds. Appropriated funds. So, but referred to there. So there's the only money that would go into this clean energy technology fund would be taxpayer dollars, correct? No. That's not correct. So um, what what are the other sources that would go into that fund? Under sub uh, under section 194A, um, yeah. as previously mentioned, there was such amounts as are deposited in the fund under this subtitle. Um, okay. Subtitle A creates a revolving fund. All right. So under. And then it invests in, in a portfolio, is that right? 
On page 24, okay. um, section 197 refers to direct support. All right. Which would include the issuance of loans, letter of, of credit, loan guarantees, insurance products, and other credit enhancements or debt instruments. Would the gentleman yield on that, on your point? Right here, Ms. Walden, behind well, you. Yeah. But, but to counsel, it doesn't mean that the industry is not compelled to put money into this fund. I was, I was just saying that re repayment of loans would go into right. the revolving fund. But so there's no, as, as, as to his point, there's, the industry is not compelled to put money into this fund. There's no requirement the industry put any money into this fund, is there? I, I don't believe there's any requirement that anyone put money into the fund. So it's a, it's a fund with an open-ended authorization, right? And so there's no limitation on how much appropriators could or the Congress could dump into this fund, correct? It's such sums as are appropriated. Okay. And then, um, and then whatever the other fees that come in are because out of this revolving fund, there, this advisory board or this new entity is going to invest in new technologies by granting loans, correct? Loans and other forms of assistance that are listed. And of those loans, then, as they get paid back, um, this advisory board can assess fees on those loans, correct? On page My 8, I believe. My understanding of the provision uh, Line 22 two of page 8. Refers to administrative expenses. For so this. they can assess any level of administrative expense on these loans, correct? There's no limitation on the overhead for this program, is there? There's, at the top of page 9, uh, B there, fund to the extent that administrative expenses okay. are not reimbursed through fees in amount not to exceed 1.5 percent of the amounts in the fund as of the beginning of each fiscal year shall be available to pay the administrative expenses for the fiscal year necessary. Right, but that 1.5 percent fund limitation is, is off of the, uh, the revolving fund proceeds, correct? So who do they assess the fees on? Amounts in the fund, that's correct, in answer to your first question. But this says to the extent that administrative expenses are not reimbursed through fees, then an amount not to exceed one and a half percent of the amounts in the fund as of the beginning of the f okay. Let me let me switch to a different question then. I, I note on uh, page here on definitions of, uh, I believe it's page 7, talks about the, these different terms. And on, page, on line 11, it talks about the state and then a state and then a District of Columbia. I assume these, uh, uh, the question I want to lead up to is, are Indian tribes, would they be able to, uh, if they had renewable breakthrough technologies, apply for this fund, to participate in this fund? Because you, you, you define Commonwealth, you define District of Columbia state. Native Americans and the tribes be able to participate? Are they expressly allowed? I didn't see that in the, in the amendment here, but it's my first time to read through it this morning. On page 24, section 197, direct support, um, that, that support is not limited to states or any specific entities. All right. Thank you. My time's expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, further discussion of the amendment? In order of seniority, who seeks recognition? Yes, generally it's recognized, Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we're kind of out of um, sight, your line of sight over here. Uh, I move to strike the last word. I have a question I'd like to ask of counsel, if I may. On page 10 of the um, of the amendment. At uh, where you have Initiative 5, it's on line 19, the transformation of the building stock of the United States to zero net energy consumption. I was seeking clarification on that. If this is moving to if the objective would be to move to no energy consumption in addition to a base standard that would be established or referenced at some point, or is it just a drafting error and is to be to 
zero net energy emissions and seeking clarification on that. The term zero net energy consumption isn't defined in the amendment, uh, but this term is used in section 195, which refers to deployment goals for the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. So uh, reclaiming my time there, if you're not sure then if it means zero emissions or no additional consumption. The term is not defined in the amendment. Okay. Thank you. I have one additional question for you. Would the gentleman, gentlelady yield on that? I'll be happy to. Just again, the question, so there is no baseline for which we're going to pro project zero net energy use. There, we have not established a baseline. I, Council, there's no baseline established. Is that correct? With respect to zero net energy consumption? Correct. I don't see one in the... So, so how do we... How are we going to project if we're at zero net energy use if we don't establish a baseline? I would ask the question to the author of the amendment. If the gentleman would yield. I would uh, yield. I our will our reclaim purpose my time. sure is. Oh, I'm not sorry. It's not my time. I, I reclaim my time and I yield to the gentleman from Michigan because I think this is a central point of what we're trying to figure out. Is it no new emissions? Is there a standard that is laid down somewhere that we can have no further consumption than what is considered a primary consumption? And for clarification, I yield to the gentleman from Michigan. Well, I, I think this is an important point, but. I think we want to stimulate both. And so having, having said that, uh, I think the, the sensible thing to do is to see to it that we stimulate both. And if we start establishing baselines and trying to define which we're going to put money into, we may very well find that we're denying ourselves the growth of new opportunities and new kinds of energy resources. Reclaiming my time, I, I thank the author of the amendment for that, but I would like to suggest that before we move forward that we decide if there is a standard that we can generate no consumption past a certain point or if there is a baseline from which we are building and saying we do not want to okay. go above that or people are going to have to buy carbon credits or if we are trying to move the building stock toward a zero emissions, I would just seek further clarification on that issue. And the authors of the amendment, I would love to hear from them. Or let's set it aside and come back to it when we have a definition that says this is what we're going to expect of our building and construction community in this country. General Lady yield for I do yield to the gentleman from Washington. The intent of this, if, if, if you look at this language, this is not talking about zero net energy consumption in the United States. It refers to the transformation of the building stock of the United States to zero net energy consumption. What that refers to is basically evaluating a house or a office building rather than the entire United States. And what the goal is, and we are not there yet, but this is an aspirational goal, is to build our homes so that they don't use net energy. Now, those homes exist today in the United States. I visited some on a little place called Lopez Island, Washington, a couple weeks ago. It's a low-income housing development. And they have built houses that, through a combination of photovoltaic energy and passive solar and straw bale construction that does passive solar heating, they use no net energy in that home through a combination of good insulation, passive solar, and photovoltaic. That's the aspiration that Reclaiming this my to. time since I'm almost out, and I appreciate the gentleman's um, explanation of that. I would just ask then if uh, the project that he has referenced with the home, if in Section 196, the Clean Energy Deployment Administration and the administrator of the administration that will be appointed by the secretary, would it be their task to decide what, it, what is hitting that standard of, of that new building stock with the zero net energy consumption? Is your 
No. Your objective. No, uh, the gentleman lady yield for a moment. I do yield. Yes, that is not our intention. The that administrator will not be setting standards for building codes. What the language suggests, however, is that the administrator will look potentially for technologies that could help us toward the goal of obtaining buildings with maximum building efficiency. So this won't require, this will not have them sending any minimum standards for our housing or buildings whatsoever. It will suggest that we should look for technologies that could help us in that direction. That's the only reason the language is there. Thank you. Yeah, but Gentlelady's time has expired. Is there further discussion of the pending amendment? Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To strike the last word. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, I, I guess a couple questions I have. Um, one would be to, um, on page five, um, a line to council, line 19, 20, and 21, it says technology related to the production, use, transmission, storage, control, and conservation of energy. Would uh, the carbon capture and sequestration qualify under those, that terminology? This definition doesn't specify specific technologies. The Clean Energy Deployment Administration would have to interpret this language and implement it. Thank you. So I, I think what would have been helpful is if in the drafting of this amendment, as my colleague from Washington State did, and he listed um, of various items that these funds could go to, that, that they would be, and if, if we get to a point of modifying and and clarifying uh, this amendment, um, it probably could be helpful to have some of these listed down, and then you could do and and others that may be uh, not. I guess the concern is that this may be all new technology focused, and the concern is what about current technology that's being tested but not deployed? We all know that carbon capture and sequestration is probably 10 years down the road. A lot is riding on this bill and the electricity cost of, of millions of Americans based upon whether this technology is available or not. So I would, I would hope that carbon capture and sequestration um, is, is part of that. The, um, I, I, I want to go back to, to these, these two funds again. Um, we have two funds, one which the appropriators and one, the generators of the fund. And the question is, where does the money, obviously the appropriator's funds come from general revenue through the appropriation process. The generators of the fund, is that money coming from dollars through the cap and trade system by which then will be allocated to, through the, through the secretary to these new emerging technologies? There's no provision in this amendment for allowance value from uh, Title VII to, to go to the, this administration. So where are the dollars from the generators of the fund coming from? Uh, Section 194 again specifies that it would be either through uh, appropriations or amounts deposited in the fund under the subtitle. Gentlemen, yield to me. I would. As I understand it, you have appropriated funds and then the other funds from generators, repayment of loans. Is that, is that the correct understanding? That and fees, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. Fees. Now, who would pay the fees? Uh, the fees would be paid on, under C2. The fees would be paid either by um, those receiving financial assistance or, if necessary, out of the fund. Okay. So you're borrowing money. Um, and you're going to repay the loan, and then you have to pay fees. And the fees are part of this fund. To council or to chairman or? Uh, if I may help, if the gentleman yield for a moment. I mean, that, the intent, the fees are the interest in the loan payments, basically, and the fees associated with administering the loan. That was the intent of the language, and that's, there's, there's no hidden fee structure uh, obligation in the bill. 
And by the way, one other thing, if I can, Mr. Shimkus, there's one thing I think I wanted to make sure you were aware of in the bill, because you've, you've raised this issue a couple times about coal. If you look at page 26, this, this bill is very much technology neutral. All God's children of inventors can participate in this fund, but it does have a prioritization if you look at the bottom of page 26. It basically provides that, um, that funds will be prioritized to provide the maximum practical percentage of support to promote breakthrough technologies. It is oriented towards trying to move forward to new non-commercialized technologies. It's my belief that coal sequestration fits within that classification and money would be available. Yeah, the gentleman would, I, I appreciate that, but my time's almost expired and I wanted to ask one more question. Um, and, and the concern is, and this is just a statement why I'm in opposition to this bill, um, the 30% uh, of the financial support available, which uh, the uh, uh, ranking member of the Energy Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Upton, was talking about, is, is, is too low an amount for nuclear power and new technologies in nuclear power. I think that is the same issue that was addressed in what the Senate amendments had a, had a concern of. And I think if we want to uh, really be supportive of the expansion of nuclear power, that percentage would, has to be Would the gentleman yield? I'd be, well, my time has expired. Well, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman have two additional minutes. I thank Without the objection. Chairman Emeritus, and I yield to uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Markey. I thank the gentleman very much. And I am just going to follow up on what the gentleman from Washington just said. Uh, yes, there is a limitation of 30 percent for any one technology. Uh, and for the sake of the discussion, that might be nuclear technology. But that also then opens up the fund for carbon capture and sequestration advanced technology as well, which is also of interest to our committee because we are trying to create a balanced long-term energy portfolio for the country, um, but it would not limit it to that as well. It also would open it up for renewable technology. So again, we are not trying to allow any one of our energy technologies to be the only basket that we are uh, we're relying upon. So, um, so yes, uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration but in order to advance coal technology uh, is something that will benefit from this. And by not allowing one technology, nuclear, to gobble it up in its totality, it does allow for coal to be a beneficiary. Yes. I yield back to the would, gentleman. Would, would the gentleman yield to me? I would. I, would I want to thank the gentleman. Yield. He raises a good point, and, and I think the committee does need to understand this. If you go to page 8, you will find the Clean Energy Investment Fund is the subject of our discussion. That is section 194. <coughs> There will be a clean energy investment fund uh, that, that's, that's here referred to, and it will be composed of such amounts as are f deposited in the fund under the subtitle. That's from fees and things of that kind. And then such other funds as may, such other sums as may be appropriated to supplement the funds. And so then from that uh, comes, comes the money. And that comes through the uh, at line 13 authorization of appropriations, and then you 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 come down under C expenditures from the fund, and the fund amounts in the fund shall be available to the administration for obligation without fiscal year limitation to remain available until until expended. Then you go on down. You got two, which is the administrative fees. So you have different sources of money, some of which are fees and things of that kind, some of which are appropriated funds, and the Secretary spends them to make loans and things of that kind for the purposes of the Act. And I know my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a lot of fees, uh, fees will be passed on to the ratepayers and yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Is there further discussion of the pending amendment? Gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and we appreciate very much the time spent on this amendment because uh, those of us particularly who represent coal areas um, have a lot of concerns about this bill. But uh, in the base bill, we establish a carbon storage research corporation, and it's my understanding that there's going to be like a billion dollars a year for 10 years available for research on carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, and then in this amendment, and I just want to verify this, uh, un uh, under Chairman Dingell's, former Chairman Dingell's amendment, uh, anyone, clean energy technology would include 
carbon capture and sequestration as well? I, I would ask the council that question. Well, let's see if the author, one of the, the authors author. of the uh, amendment, Mr. Inslee, do you have an answer? Uh, yes, as I expressed to Mr. Shimkus, um, carbon sequestration uh, would be, in my understanding of this, covered. A prioritization would be given well, to under your, You said un it's your understanding, or are you emphatic about it? Or yes, I mean, that's, it's in the bill. It, it covers all technologies that have the capacity of reducing carbon emissions associated with energy. And I believe that would include uh, uh, technologies that sequester carbon from coal-fired plants. I see nothing to indicate it would not. Okay. So, so uh, under the base bill, we have the Carbon Storage Corporation Correct. and that money, and then uh, uh, applicants, applications would be accepted under this amendment for carbon capture and sequestration. That, that is my understanding, well. and it is our intent. Now. I want to say again, there is a prioritization for the breakthrough parts. And who makes that? Who sets that priority? The uh, the uh, the governing uh, entity, which is defined in the bill, and I believe coal could compete. Coal sequestered coal could compete on the same grounds with any other technology. But the, that's but the priorities would be established by those appointed to serve on the advisory. That's board. correct. And I again, uh, this amendment does not. Uh, in any way indicate that just because coal has another billion dollar fund to means they're not eligible under this one. They are, it is eligible under this fund. But it will obviously depend upon the advisory council. Now, and, and just to summarize this once again, money can be appropriated for this uh, purpose, for this new entity within the Department of Energy, and then interest generated by the loans made, that's where the fees would come from to uh, that's referred to in here as well, and that if the and then there are administrative costs that they say can come from the general fund, and that money would be transferred on a monthly basis. Is that is that under, is that true? That is my understanding, and perhaps we should make sure council is ask answering your question accurately. But that's generally my understanding. There's a combination of general fund money to get this fund going. Then there will be repayment of loans that are made by the, by the borrowers, the borrowing technologies, together with the principal and interest. And there may be some setup fees that the group may charge, which are classified, quote, as fees in the bill. But those would be the, the two sources of funds in the bill. But, but if, the, if there is a provision in here that if administrative fees cannot be met or cannot be paid, there's not adequate funding for it, then money would just be taken from the general fund for that purpose. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Now, now excuse me, with this caveat, when you say taken from the general fund, all of this is subject to appropriations of the United States Congress and signature by the President. So these people are not just going to reach into the till and grab money. It has well, to all be appropriate. It says to the extent that administrative expenses are not reimbursed through fees, an amount not to exceed 1.55 percent of the amounts in the fund as of the beginning of each fiscal year should be available to pay the administrative expenses. And then it says the amounts required to be transferred to the fund under this section shall be transferred monthly from the general fund. But it's your understanding that that's money appropriated and that is this correct. Is not money that's going to be transferred without any kind of. That's correct. It's an appropriated amount subject to appropriations okay. authority. Okay. That's correct. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance. Would it, okay. If the gentleman I, I just, yield. again, it, it is uh, just so you, I, we clarify this. I think everything that the gentleman from Washington State has said is true. Carbon capture and sequestration can qualify under its own program or under this program. That's defined on page five down the bro down at the bottom, which is. A new clean energy technology means a technology related to the production, use, transmission, storage, control, or conservation of energy. Carbon capture and sequestration would qualify. And on page 30 uh, of uh, the amendment, uh, there is a definition of how that fee structure should work, but it's principally an appropriations process that would be used for uh, funding, although the revenue generated from the fees could also be used. Gentlemen's time has expired. Further discussion of the amendment? Boyer. Thank you. I move to strike the last word. I'd ask uh, my good friend Mr. Dingle 
As I was looking on uh, page five under the definitions for uh, at the bottom for clean energy technology, and uh, as I listened to your co-sponsors talking about this is meant to be technology neutral, and I was looking at the eligibility criteria for different activities. So as I as I note under clean energy technologies, you're you're seeking a technology, and you're hoping that it be then. You call it breakthrough, it could be a step ahead, it could be next generation. And uh, um, the gentleman is a supporter of, of uh, nuclear energy. The issue regarding uh, nuclear reprocessing or recycling of spent nuclear fuel, uh, would that be uh, a clean energy technology? As I read at the bottom of A and then it can, goes on page, top of page six, it would be that type of technology that stabilizes atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations through reduction, avoidance, or sequestration of energy-related emissions and reduces the need for additional energy supplies by using existing energy supplies with greater efficiency. And that would be the reprocessing of spent <laughs> nuclear fuel, would it not? Uh, I have to say that that's probably the case. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. Any further discussion? Are we ready for the question? Who, who see, yes, gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. For what purpose do you seek recognition? To strike the requisite number of words. Gentleman's recognized. Um, first, to ask counsel a question. Looking at uh, page three, uh, lines 13 through the bottom of the page and going on to page four, uh, there's a discussion of prevailing wages on projects. Is that a requirement of the payment of Davis Bacon wages? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. Looking at page three of the amendment, uh, there's beginning at line 13, subsection K, it says wage weight rate requirements. And then it goes down and talks about the payment of not less than those prevailing, the wages at rates not less than those prevailing on projects of a character similar to the contract work in the civil subdivision of the state in which the contract work is to be performed. And it goes on. Is that a Davis-Bacon wage requirement? That, I believe that refers to the Davis-Bacon language, yes. Thank you very much. Um, turning to page 5 uh, and to this language uh, under subsection 4 of the Clean Energy Technology and following up on the question by my colleague, Mr. Shimkus, uh, who asked you specifically about carbon capture and sequestration of coal, uh, and you indicated that that might be but is not clearly stated as one of the clean energy technologies. Um, would hydrological power be listed or, or be included in this definition? There's no specific technologies that are listed. There's a, a definition that would be interpreted and implemented by the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. So that would be subject to interpretation by the department? The Clean Energy Deployment uh, Administration would interpret this language. Okay. And they would determine whether hydropower was included or not? by rule or reg? I don't think there's any provision for regulations uh, under this, but yes, they would interpret. By interpretation then. And would that be true of, I just want to go through a series of terms, new hydropower or incremental hydropower uh, or in-stream hydropower? All of those would be subject to interpretation by the department or by this agency? That would be true for any specific technology. Yeah, just want to then I'd like to ask a question of the authors of the bill, any one of the authors who, of the amendment who might be willing to answer it. Mr. Shimkus asked uh, whether or not this would apply to clean coal technology. Uh, I believe one of the authors uh, indicated that it was his intent at least. Um, uh, I'd like to ask the authors whether or not it is their intent to include as well hydrologic power, new hydrologic power, incremental hydrologic power, uh, or in-stream hydrologic power. Um, but Chairman Yield? Certainly. The fact of the matter is that's pretty much defined at uh, number four under uh, at page five. I would note uh, that Mr. Chimkus also made the observation that would it, would it cover uh, nuclear reprocessing. Uh, that it, it could, but I would note that uh, one of the reasons we put the 30% limit in is to, is to prevent that from transpiring. 
uh, because we don't want one technology to soak all the money out of this particular fund. Well, reclaiming my time, I understand the 30 percent limitation, and I would agree with the gentleman that the language uh, at the bottom of page 5 and the top of page 6 would appear to include all of the items I've listed, including the item Mr. Shimkus listed, plus all of the various hydropowers that I've listed, but the Council has said all of those be, would be subject to interpretation. My question of the authors of the amendment is, if that's their intent, uh, I'd like to know it, uh, so that that is at least on the record in this hearing. Uh, and second, would they be willing at some point to consider including specific references to those types of clean technology, which will reduce so much, greenhouse gases? Yielding yes again. Would the chairman repeat that because there's so much racket in the, <laughs> in the back? I'm not hearing the gentleman. Let's have order. Um, I would agree with the gentleman that all of the types of energy that I listed, hydro, new hydro, incremental hydro, and in-stream hydro, would appear to be included in the broad language appearing at the page, bottom of page 5 and the top of page 6. However, Council has suggested, in answer to my question, that that all would be subject to interpretation because none of those items are specifically listed. Therefore, my, my question is, is it the intent of the authors to include those so that we get that in the record? Yeah. And second, would they be amenable to, at some point, listing them so that it would not be left to the vagaries of interpretation. Okay. Sure. And Mr. Markey seems to be agreeing, so maybe I can get his agreement. I, I, <laughs> I'm, agree I'm agreeing that the technologies would be inclusive, but not exclusive. Certainly. Because, so we don't want to exclude other innovative technologies. So the, the technologies that you are listing obviously could qualify, but we don't want any list to then be exclusive because then that would be something that would be limited to the imagination of the members of this committee rather than the scientific and, and uh, engineering community. I agree with the gentleman wholeheartedly and thank him. I yield back to balance my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Is there further, is there further discussion? If not, let's proceed to consideration of the amendment. All those in favor of the uh, Jingle Chairman. amendment will say aye. Mr. Aye. aye. Oppose no. Mr. Chairman, just as a matter of protocol, aren't I supposed to withdraw my reservation? <laughs> Which I do. The gentleman is correct. Mr. Chairman. The uh, point of order that was reserved by the gentleman from Oregon has been withdrawn, and the vote has been taken. Mr. Chairman, who is asked for your recorded vote? The gentleman is asking for a recorded vote. Uh, let's proceed to a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Votes aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Aye. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Mr. Gordon votes aye. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Aye. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Stupak. Stupak votes aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGette. Aye. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Votes aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Aye. Ms. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Aye. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. 
Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton, aye. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton, present. Mr. Barton votes present. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton, present. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Upton, present. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Stearns votes no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattig. No. Mr. Shattig, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. I support my friend, Mr. Dingle. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Passes. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania passes. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Would you uh, call the members who have not yet responded? Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Ross. Aye. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Chairman, yes. I'm going to switch to aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton is off present and votes aye. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. In a show of uh, total disorganization on our side on the first vote, I'm going to switch to no. <laughs> Mr. Barton is voting no. Mr. Murphy of, of Pennsylvania. Mr. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania votes aye. Have all members responded to the vote? And any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will uh, count the vote and report it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the yeas were 51 and the nays were 6. 51 ayes, 6 noes. The amendment is agreed to. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose is the gentleman from I have an amendment at the desk. Has that amendment been, uh, is that amendment to Title I? It, uh, I believe it is. It's in the definitional sections. And has that amendment been made uh, public for more than two hours? I don't know that it's been here more than two hours, but it has been submitted at full hundred copies in advance. Will the hopefully would the, on recycled, environmentally sensitive paper. Would, would, That's would, very admirable. What's but I'm concerned about the carbon emissions from all the extra. Let's print. have an identification of the amendment before hey, I Mr. recognize Chairman, you to offer it. Uh, it would be Walden-018. 
is at least that's the title at the top here. It was in that box we put on the table that's now disappeared from the table. <laughs> we haven't we haven't seen it. If the gentleman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll reserve a point of order. Well, there's there's no amendment pending to offer a point of order. The chair uh, will will uh, uh, re recognize the gentleman at, at a later time. Well, can I inquire, Mr. Chairman, as to what happened to the box of amendments that we put on the table? Because they are You can somewhere. inquire, but the chair does not have an answer to that. Well, I hope it hasn't gone into the great biomass pile in the sky. Or something. When amendments are submitted to the clerk, the, a uh, PDF is made of the amendment and circulated to all the uh, members of the committee. And that will give members an opportunity to read it in advance and think through whether they want to do support it or oppose it or to ask questions about it and so we can have a, uh, an appropriate discussion on point. Oh, Mr. Chairman, if I may inquire. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? Well, uh, just a, a question of process. The gentleman is recognized to ask So what? they're available on a PDF. How would I access that here? I've got my laptop. How do I get it? I, I wasn't aware we'd be able to look at them by PDF. Okay. As I understand it, uh, when a member is recognized to offer an amendment, yes, it sir. is then sent on a PDF, well, but it has to be submitted uh, two hours in advance. Would the would the gentleman are those the rules of our? No. The, the, the would would the gentleman from Oregon yield on his? I, I will, Mr. Chairman. Before you do that, hold hold off a second because I might have given you misinformation. Just okay. gentlemen, suspend for a minute. Uh, if the gentleman uh, would yes, permit, you asked a question of uh, how do you get the PDF. Right. Now, I've been informed that when an amendment uh, is being submitted to the desk, that a PDF is sent to each member's office. And then when a member is recognized to offer the amendment, then a hard copy is distributed to the members here uh, at the, uh, at, at the uh, dais. So, um, Unless we have this amendment in advance, it is not. Uh, uh, it is the chair set out rules by which he will not uh, refuse to recognize members for an amendment that has not been uh, made available two hours in advance. Now, if we can get your amendment and and we continue to talk about it, we might have that two-hour time limit met. But, point uh, of order, Mr. Chairman. Who who, seek, who is making a point of order? Well, Mr. Scalise, but I also have a question. Well, point of order is a priority uh, you, over a question. You just said that a member would, you would refuse to recognize a member who didn't have an amendment in prior to two hours in advance. That's not what you had said yesterday when you and uh, Ranking Member Barton were having your colloquy on the procedure. You said there would be a precedent given to members that had it over two hours, but you would still recognize people who didn't have an amendment at the desk two hours in advance, and now you're saying that you would refuse to recognize. So. What changed between yesterday? Well, I think there might be a misunderstanding uh, on your part about yesterday's colloquy. Members will be recognized. So. Members will be recognized to offer an amendment that is pertinent to the title under consideration, or uh, and or that has been available for two hours, and we uh, will not close out any title. So members will be allowed to offer. Uh, 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 an amendment at a later time. We're not closing out anybody's opportunity to offer an amendment. We just simply think it's fair for members to know what's coming before it's offered. Further, just I would yield to point, point Mr. Mr. Barton, you had a question. I just want to point out some flaws here, and it's a question. The minority submitted approximately a dozen amendments to the majority staff last night after our Republican uh, caucus at 6 o'clock. Now, so they've been available for two hours 
at least to the majority staff. But we didn't, we haven't submitted all of those amendments to the desk this morning. Mr. Dingell's first amendment was not seen by the minority last night, but it was, it, it has been circulated to today, but it, he was recognized within the, this, this, this two hour window. So we've got a situation here. If, if your decision point is two hours at the desk opposed, as opposed to two hours to the staff, it's going to be basically an extremely difficult markup to comply because. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'd be think, happy to I yield. think I can clarify it. Uh, there were amendments submitted by your side of the aisle last night. There are only two of those amendments that are to this title, but all of those amendments would be subject to being called up uh, and meet and will meet the requirement of the two hour time limit. Mr. Dingle's amendment was circulated to all members last night, so it was available for members to see it. Uh, we are going title by title, so members will have the opportunity to know that the subject in that title will be debated and they uh, can be here if they want to debate that title or, uh, or choose not to be here uh, if they don't want to get involved in that particular title. So if, if the gentleman's amendment was part of the amendments submitted by the staff last night? I don't think this one was. Okay. No, in, in, if I might, Mr. Chairman, no, it was not. We were busy photocopying and working with legislative Well, we're, we're going to make the amendment in order at the uh, earliest possible time in compliance with the at least the, I think the a process that's fairest to all members and that's that they have I a understand. chance to see the amendment. Well, I don't I don't disagree Mr. Chairman they should have a chance but this 2 hour notification requirement is going to mean we might as well plan on being here all next week because we have over 400 amendments um, and uh, we're changing them as we go. Um, I, it's not going to be possible to to put all of those amendments out at the desk uh, in the in a two-hour time frame. You're, so you're going to create a situation where where we seek recognition to offer an amendment, and then just like in this case, Mr. Walden, um, he hasn't had it at the desk for two hours, so it's going to be deferred, and you're going to end up having about. 60 or, seven amen 60 or 70 amendments that are deferred till the end of the week. I, I, think, I don't see any way I, I think you're pa painting too dire a picture. Uh, if amendments are submitted and there are changes, conforming changes or uh, non-substantive non changes, uh, if they're submitted two hours in advance, uh, I don't think we're going to quibble about a um, correction of that amendment because we'll know what the amendment's all about. Uh, we took uh, almost two hours on the First Amendment. So I, I think, uh, I, I don't want to predict how much time we're going to take on amendments, but if you have 400 amendments, let's see them. And well, you'll get it, to see them. We're not, <laughs> it's just and when it gets to the title point, by title, it, it Well, when it, it comes, a while. comes to a, a title, well, I would urge that members uh, start getting your amendments in on the earlier titles first That's so that, uh, so that uh, we can get them considered. But we're not going to preclude any amendments. M Who has an amendment? M Mr. Chairman, can I get one yes. other clarification? Mm -hmm. If I might. Recognized. Yes. So if we are working on an, am an amendment to your amendment in the nature of a substitute, and, and as we were having that discussion, for example, on this uh, authorized fund in the last amendment, and a member wanted to put a cap on that fund, say, put a, uh, offer an amendment, a secondary amendment of, you know, a billion dollars on that fund. Would that type of amendment also, then under your proposed, uh, ac uh, your, your protocols, um, require a, a two-hour delay? Because I know as we've marked up other bills in uh, the Well, past, if the gentleman uh, would yes, permit, uh, an amendment to an amendment would not be in order. All right because we have an amendment pending. Okay, then 
if we, for example, had adopted this last amendment as we did in a bipartisan way, somebody then would have to come back and try to amend that later, and it would be a two-hour delay to amend that. Is that accurate? Uh, I think that uh, would be accurate. Okay. And, and I, just one final question. These are not actually rules of the committee, correct? This, this is a, a process you are just working through. These are not the rules of the committee, but the inherent power of the chair for recognition can be uh, used in a way that would promote the orderly process of uh, debate and amendments, and we are trying to establish that uh, procedure. Parliamentary inquiry. Who is making the parliamentary, parliamentary inquiry? inquiry? Gentleman from Florida. Let's say uh, uh, we get through Title I and we are in Title IV and somebody has an amendment to Title I. Are you going to allow members to go back and uh, amend Title I? I, I don't uh, want to be uh, rigid and say that they can't at that point, uh, but uh, I would expect that if you have passed up Title I, uh, that your appropriate time to offer an amendment to Title I will be at the end of the bill, because we do want to go for Title I, II, III in sequence, and it would, wouldn't be um, helpful to members to take them by surprise on an amendment on Title I after we have just completed Title V. No, I understand that, but you offer an amendment, let's say, in noon uh, for Title I and it is Thursday and you have had a two, or two or three hours, could the member then go back and amend Title I with this? Are you allowing that? On Thursdays? The rules are different. No, it's, it's, it's a joke. <laughs> the question well, of the gentleman is Wednesday, whether, then. whether hypothetically on Thursday or some other day uh, during the markup, uh, even though we've gone beyond the number of titles, would we then return to Title that's, One? That's the question. And uh, I would, I would think that we'll definitely return to Title One, and amendment will be in order after we've completed all the titles. And I, I would think that's the fairest way to proceed, but I don't want to say absolutely rigidly, because uh, in consultation with Mr. Barton and others, we may think it just makes a lot of sense. It's an amendment that's been agreed to, so l just g give me a little leeway, and we'll try to we'll try to make this whole process work. Uh, just, just, I, and and I certainly will, and I understand that. But in protocol, in historical. Could a person in a full markup, hasn't it been historically that a person could go back to Title I and offer amendment even though it was past Amendment I? Haven't we d done that? Well, it depends on the process. If, if we are considering a bill title by title, an amendment may be offered to Title I, and after all amendments have been offered to Title I, the title is closed. But we are not proceeding on that basis. Okay. Thank you. M Mr. Chairman, one other parliamentary yes. inquiry. So that we can help with you, the process you're establishing, would it be asking too much then of the staff to notify us of when the amendments were received by your office? In other words, we drop off a box of amendments. I don't know at what point that two-hour clock. St I know when we, I drop. We'd be it off. happy to do that. That way, we can not call up amendments that aren't. We'd be right. happy to do that. Thank you, sir. Well, the chair seeks recognition for uh, someone who has an amendment to, t to Title I that has been submitted two hours in advance. Yes, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For what purpose do you seek recognition? Uh, to offer an amendment, Amendment 601, at the desk. And is that, if the chair may inquire, an amendment to Title I? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. And uh, here, counsel. was it uh, submitted last night with the other amendments? It meets your two-hour requirement, Mr. Chairman, with the one exception that there was some about a two or three word change in the exact amendment to make it germane. Okay. It will didn't change. Could you uh, identify the amendment so we don't yeah. know what, which one it is? Uh, it is Rogers 601.
has. So, uh, I, I'm informed that the, a different amendment has been submitted by you, not that one. Just as you stated, Mr. Chairman, it, it, sometimes there's perfecting language. The amendment is identical to the intent. Uh, there was a slight change. I think it's three words total to, to make sure that it met, met the uh, conditions of germaneness. The amendment is the same, and they have they have it at the desk. Okay, the gentlemen, will wait. Um, I'm going to ask the gentleman to uh, put aside this amendment for, for temporarily while we straighten this out. And uh, let's proceed to a, another amendment. Mr. Mr. Stupak, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. It's number 070. Is this an amendment to Title I? Yes, it is. And has it been distributed to two hours in advance? Yes. Or, or met the two hour time limit? Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Stupak of Michigan, page 93, line 11, strike January 1, 2009, and insert July 1, 2010. I reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman uh, from Oregon reserves a point of order. Uh, the, the amendment has been read. The gentleman from Michigan is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll be fairly brief on this. Uh, H.R. 2454 lays out, successfully lays out a cap and trade system by its very nature will provide economic incentives for carbon reduction. While I was not involved in the original negotiations or this section, the new source standards could eliminate any further development of coal fired generation around the country. In Michigan, because of our. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our, we don't, we're having a debate on an amendment we don't have. Yeah. The gentleman from Michigan will suspend. Do we have a hard copy distributed? It's coming, Mr. Chairman. Okay, let's let's hold off until this. So we're debating the second Democrat minimum in a row, and this one we don't even have it at the desk. The copies are coming. That's a fair way to do things, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think you make a very good point, and we will suspend until uh, you have the amendment. Mr. Chairman, just was a, a point of inquiry, dance? Mr. Chairman. Was Greg Walton's not at the desk? Just a point of inquiry. Uh, Mr. Stearns. Now, does it, this two-hour rule apply to your side, too? Yes. So that means if, uh, if your side suddenly wants to amend their own, as a result of the discussion here, we have a debate, and they suddenly realize they made a mistake, in their bill, they want to amend their own amendment. They won't be able to do it without a two-hour delay? Uh, the chair's going to have to deal with real situations instead of hypothetical ones. Let, let, let's see if we can get this thing to work. Well, Mr. Stupak's amendment is not even at the desk, Mr. Chairman. I'm not a, I, I think I'm probably for Bart's amendment, <laughs> based on what little I've read about it. But it's not. Okay. Let me. Greg's was at the desk. Mr. Rogers was at the desk, but Mr. Rogers can't be found. The, the chair will. Uh, the chair will indicate that the amendment has is at the desk. It is now being distributed. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan has asserted that his amendment was submitted two hours in advance. We have no indica We have indication from our staff, and be interested if your staff has other information. To the contrary, if not, this appears to be an amendment that would be in order under the um, under the rules that, that we're operating under. <laughs> that you created. Okay. Uh, 
I'm now going to recognize the gentleman from Michigan for five minutes to uh, speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said, I'll try to speed this up. Uh, Mr. Ross and I were trying to figure out with all these amendments, uh, we figure in our math is not the best, but it's going to take 33 days and eight hours to get through all these amendments at the current rate we're going. So let me try to uh, expedite this a little bit. On, on this amendment here, Mr. Chairman, this is the one we had a chance just to speak about briefly, and, and you had promised to work with me on this, and because of my schedule, not yours, but because of my schedule, uh, we could not put much more time on it. Uh, and, and so what I'd like to do is just offer this amendment, and I'm going to withdraw it, because uh, talking with your staff and that this morning, there's some more documents I want to produce to uh, try to see if we can't get some exception. And the reason why I'm doing this, uh, maybe we can work this one out before we get much further. But in Michigan, uh, we're one of those states that require, require or rely on coal-fired generation for our electrical. And right now, because most of our coal-fired generation is over 50 years old, many of these companies are going through a process of reapplying and putting new plants online. The date in the bill is January 1, 2009. Uh, Michigan has made some uh, changes in their process, which has delayed and resulted in some delay for some of these folks who are going through the permitting process. So since we did not know that January 1, 2009 was going to be the date, and Michigan has some different wrinkles they're putting in their process, I think it would be unfair now to tell these people they have to go back to rules that they were not aware of, especially since there's been some changes in the process in, in the state of Michigan. So with those representations and with your willingness to work on this a little bit more, to see if we can't work something out, I would withdraw this amendment at this time and continue to work with you. Uh, I appreciate what the gentleman suggesting. The uh, gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, wanted to speak on this amendment. Uh, oh, you have an amendment. Okay. The gentleman withdraws his amendment, and yes, I sir. certainly do pledge to work with you and to see if we Look forward to continue to work with you on it, withdraw my amendment, resolution. ask unanimous consent. Okay. Without objection, the amendment uh, is Ms. Mr. Chairman. Who is seeking recognition? Uh, I, I need to withdraw my uh, reservation <laughs> on the amendment, I believe. It's part of okay. the process. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 um, it, you don't really need to, but if, if you do want to, that's fine. <laughs> I, I, I can leave it in place. We can vote on it. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska seek recognition? Thank you. Should have uh, Terry Amendment Number Three at the desk. Is that amendment to Title One? Yes, and it was delivered over two hours ago. Okay. Does the uh, clerk have the amendment to report it? I, I don't see the amendment, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, there was a process where many staffers delivered in boxes to people on, uh, that were, we thought, representing the clerk. Uh, Mr. It's Mr. Terry, you're, to you're me that all of ours haven't been recognized, but yours have. You're, uh, you. you're, you're, Mr. Terry, if you would permit. Um, Let's take a half hour break. Let the staffs coordinate. Yeah, there, this. there's something very wrong right Mr. now, Mr. Chairman. And let's see agree. if we can uh, understand where what amendments are ready to go. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. So, uh, Could, Mr. Barton, are you? Uh, yeah, I just want to. I want to point for the, for especially for my friends on the majority side. They think that maybe we're sandbagging you. Now, maybe you're not thinking that, but it wouldn't surprise me if you thought we were. We're turning these amendments in. There's some young staffer out in the hall somewhere <laughs> that literally has to apparently typeset in the entire written amendment into a computer, and that doesn't... So if we, if we hand an amendment here to the desk, which we're doing, that doesn't count, apparently. You've got to take it out in the hall, and, and this young man or young woman works like a little eager beaver out there actually typing it in and it doesn't count apparently till he gets it in the computer so I, there may be a thousand pages of amendments outside well you, you, you've got a system that's not going to work mr. chairman well, you, well let's you may you uh, you make a good point let's find out uh, what the eager beavers are doing let's have our let our staff uh, coordinate this and when we get back we'll be I hope ready to proceed in an orderly way. So we'll break now and uh, 
members, if they wish, can have a half hour to grab a bite to eat, but no more than a half hour. The uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee taking a half-hour break. Uh, this is their second day discussing energy and climate change legislation. This morning on Washington Journal, the ranking member, Texas Representative Joe Barton, spoke about the issue. Joining us now is Texas lawmaker Joe Barton, the senior Republican on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which is marking up a bill this week uh, to overhaul the energy uh, system in the country as well as combat global climate change. But first, we wanted to talk to you.